Welcome from the New Church of Boulder Valley Breakfast Cafe to the New Church of Boulder Valley Worship Service. Thanks for, um, for joining us for that wonderful breakfast, and thank you for those who put that on. A uh, wonderful thing to enjoy. And those who are with us online, welcome to you. I hope you had a good breakfast as well. Um, I'll start with this prayer, and then um, Willie will have a prelude, but just letting you know that today we are starting a seven-week sermon series or a spiritual growth program on building healthy relationships. So if anyone here needs help with relationships, which we all do, um, hopefully this will be meaningful to you. But we're going to start on that today. So let's start with a short prayer, if we could bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for feeding us well this morning. Thank you for that feeling of community and satisfaction of eating together. And Lord, thank you as we come here to get some spiritual food and nourish our spirit. We pray that you open your word and that you teach us the way to heaven. Amen. Count your blessings, not your troubles, folks around here say. Count your blessings, not your troubles, didn't you wake another day? Give thanks for the tree from the fruit, for the soil where you first sowed the seeds and what you lost. Did you really need it? Count your blessings, not your troubles, folks around here say. Eight days out of seven, we're all covered in cloud. Eight days out of seven, you won't see no one around. And when that sunlight comes bursting through, it's a beautiful choose. You can put your heavy baggage down. Count your blessings, not your troubles, and lose that frown. Nobody gonna stop you from leaving today. Ain't nobody gonna stop you from leaving today. And what it was that you left behind is bound to follow you. You'll find at least that's what all the wise men seem to say. Count your blessings, not your troubles, folks around here say. Count your blessings, not your troubles, did you wake another day? Count your blessings, not your troubles, did you wake another day? Please rise as we sing our first song on page 71. Humbly, Lord, we ask thy blessing. Page 71. Humbly, Lord, we ask your blessing. Keep us, Father, in your care. Let your grace descend upon us as we turn to you in prayer. Gathered here together kneeling, we would ask of you, O Lord, that your radiant light so
darkness, then when doubt and fear shall cease, let your blessing rest upon us. Grant us, Lord, your heavenly A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Lord and Savior, we thank you for these beautiful teachings that you are sharing with us today. You do give us a new commandment, though it's not new, that we should love each other. But we do need to be reminded that it takes effort and attention to be kind and loving and generous, and sometimes especially to those closest to us. We can be impatient and um, have a difficult time sometimes. So, Lord, we ask that you guide us, fill our hearts with love and compassion and our minds with the truth that shows us how to love each other as you have commanded. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord forgive us our trespasses. Amen. I want you all to be seated for reading a talk for the children, and any children who want to come forward, please feel welcome to do that. Good morning, friends. You guys enjoy your breakfast this morning? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Did you enjoy the pancakes? Mm -hmm. Have you ever made pancakes? Yeah. yeah? How do you do that? Do you know how? Hmm, yep. You buy the box at Costco. You buy the box at Costco. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that is a good solution. Um, how about if you're going to make them from scratch? Do you know what that means, make them from scratch? Okay. Well, why don't we make some this morning, okay? So we need flour. Let's see, what do we have here? We have some flour. Eggs. Eggs. What else do you think? Milk. Yeah, we got some milk. Anything else? Pancake batter. Pancake batter. Um, that's what we're going to make. Salt. Salt. And then this is some baking powder or baking soda combined. So these are how I make my pancakes. Now, if you had Rachel's delicious pancakes, you know they are very fluffy and delightful. I actually think she used buttermilk instead of regular milk. But So if we're going to make these pancakes, we have to use... Do we have to use all the ingredients or just a couple of the ingredients? All the ingredients. All of them? Yeah. Maybe you disagree with that? You think we should just use a couple of them? Uh, no? So why don't we start with the dry stuff? This is our flour. Put that in there. Okay. And then we'll put in some baking powder, you know, baking soda. You know what this stuff does to the pancakes? Helps them to rise up and get thick instead of being flat. If we didn't have this in there, it would just be a big, flat old thing. Okay? So we add that in there. How about salt? What does salt do? Do you like salt? Yeah. No. I bet you do. I do too. You like? I do too. It just tastes very good. Yeah. You know, you add a little bit of salt, and that helps it to taste good. Now we're going to mix that up. Okay? What about water? Water? Well, we're going to use milk today, okay? What would happen if we used water, do you think? Mushy? Might be a little mushy, yeah. So how about some milk? Should we add some milk? Some milk, yeah. Okay. I think it's time for the eggs. You think it's time for the eggs? What if I didn't add the eggs? What would happen? Do you I, I wouldn't rise. Wouldn't rise? Well, 
if what would happen, it would just fall apart. Egg helps it to stick together. So if we didn't, didn't add any eggs to it, it would all just kind of break apart. So that's what they're for, okay? Two eggs. Two eggs sound good? There we go. Do we want to put the shells in? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> all right. A few votes for yes, I say we'll go. we'll go with no. All right, so we got some eggs. So now we got to do what next is mix it up, right? Yeah. Tell me if it starts to look anything like a pancake batter. Can you guys make it so Winnie can see? That's kind of you to think of other people. That's nice. How's it looking? Yeah. Maybe we can try making some after church. What do you think? We can try making some after church. Yeah. Let's see if it tastes like a pancake. Yeah. Do you guys add anything to your pancakes? Like syrup? I like chocolate chip sprinkles. Chocolate chip. Mm. I, I add um, sugar to mine. Oh, okay. I have that sounds good. Sprinkle me add blueberry pancakes. So you guys, what do you think? Think we could have pancakes from that? So what would happen if we didn't add one of the ingredients or a couple of ingredients? Probably wouldn't be so good, would it? Well, the reason I want to give you that example is because we are going to talk about relationships. Do you guys have any relationships? Do you know what that word means? No. Okay. So you have, do you have a sister? Yeah. Okay. I have a brother. And you have a brother. So you have, when you guys are with each other, you have a relationship. She's your sister. You're her brother. You have a relationship with your mom and dad, so it's kind of a connection that we have with other people. We have friends. We have people to go to school with. Sometimes we get married and we have a partner that is, we're in a relationship with them. I have your dog with me. You have a relationship with your dog. So there's all kinds of relationships we have, and what we're going to talk about today is how to have healthy relationships. And if we're missing some ingredients to a healthy relationship, it doesn't work so well. You know what I mean? So sometimes we can be like this. <laughs> we're a little prickly. Like people come up to us and want to say hi, and we're like, ow, because we're like maybe not smiling at them or frowning at them or we say something unkind. It's kind of like we have a, a prickly personality. Do we want to be like that? No. No, but sometimes we are, right? Sometimes we are. Here's another plant. This actually is a healing plant. This is an aloe plant. And sometimes if you ever have a cut or a burn, you could break off a piece of this and see that stuff. That actually can help. You want some? All right, we can have some. Just kind of squeeze it. You want some? I want some. All right, you just rub that in your skin maybe if you want. You want some? I want some. You want some? Is it still coming out? There we go. It's kind of like a gel. You want to squeeze it for you? You want any, Winnie? Yeah. Feel that. What's that feel like? Kind of smooth, huh? So sometimes we can be really nice and we can be helpful and healing to people instead of being a prickly kind of personality. So we're trying to work on that. We're trying to make it so that we're not like this and we're a bit more like that. One more thing to show you before we read our story. So this is sandpaper, and it's abrasive is the word <laughs> I want to use. And it's just regular paper, and it's kind of smooth. But sometimes we can be abrasive. You know what that word means? Yeah. So feel this, and tell me how, if that feels nice and smooth to you or if it feels rough. I feel nice and You feel nice and smooth to you? Okay. Is that rough feeling? Well, sometimes we can be the same way. We can feel, we can be kind of rough instead of smooth. So hopefully we can work on having the kinds of things in our relationship that help us to be kind, okay? So bearing all that in mind, we're going to read this story. It is a story that you've probably heard before. It's a story called about a prodigal son. Have you heard the word prodigal before? No. Okay. Well, someone who's prodigal is someone who goes off and wastes all their money, goes up and parties all the time, isn't responsible at all. Like if they, had, if they were in school, they would never go to class, they would never do their work, they would probably talk back to the teacher, they would probably be rude, those kinds of things. So 
we can be prodigal in all kinds of ways. But there's a story about someone, a man who had two sons, and one of them went off. He asked his father for all of his money, and he went off, and he wasted it all in prodigal or riotous living. But then he realized that was not a good thing to do. So do you think that the son was like this initially? He kind of prickly, <laughs> you might say. But he also had a change of heart. So let's hear what it says. It's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country where he squandered his wealth in wild living. So he wasted it all. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So nothing was growing in the land either. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So he was hungry. He didn't have any food at all. He was even willing to eat the pig's food. Okay. When he came to his senses, that means he realized this was a bad thing to be doing. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he went off, went up and got, or he got up and went to his father. So how do you think the father is going to react to him coming back after he went away and wasted everything and lived a bad life? Do you have any guesses? Is the father going to be mad? What do you think? Yeah? Can you be mad? Can you be happy? No? Let's see what it says. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion or love for him. And he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Is that what you expected would happen? No. Isn't that great? Yeah. So the son, you might say, was missing a few ingredients to his life at the beginning of his story here, where he went off and he wasted everything. And he made a lot of bad choices, but he then realized he had made a mistake. And so he got something in his heart called humility, which is realizing, I need help. I don't have all the answers. I need help. And he had humility, and he felt sorry. He felt badly for what he did. And he went back and asked his father to forgive him. And his father had some wonderful ingredients himself. His ingredients were love and forgiveness and compassion. And those are the kinds of ingredients that we need to have healthy relationships, is we need to remember that we're not perfect, we make mistakes, and we need to say we're sorry and when we make mistakes, and we need to be merciful with each other, just like the Father was merciful and forgiving. And all those things help us to have better relationships and have better pancakes, so to speak. Amen. Right? Okay. So what do you think? Good story? Yeah, I think so too. Well, thanks all for listening. That's the end of our story for today. We're going to go sing our next song. Please stand as we sing on page 147, Sing Hosanna. Oh,
heads for a blessing on the children. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. I invite your children to go to your programs and we'll sing one more song. On page 108, Myriad, page 108. Next reading will be shared by Shane Smith. From the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstead, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your lights shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you, Shane. It's hard not to love the Sermon on the Mount. Right, uh, our next reading are from the Heavenly Doctrine for the New Church from Secrets of Heaven, 9377. The divine of the Lord cannot flow into a proud heart, that is, into a heart full of the love of self. For such a heart is hard and is called in the word a heart of stone. But the divine of the Lord can flow into a humble heart, because this is soft and is called in the word a heart of flesh. Such a heart is receptive of the influx of good from the Lord, that is, of the Lord. And Secrets of Heaven 6479. With people who have a negative frame of mind, that is, who are ruled through and through by a negative attitude, doubts cannot by any means be removed. For these people, one small difficulty has more validity than a thousand proofs. With them, one small difficulty is like a grain of sand placed in right in front of the pupil of the eye. And although it is only a single grain and very tiny, it nevertheless blocks one's entire field of vision. But people who have an affirmative frame of mind, that is, who are ruled through and through by an affirmative attitude, turn away small difficulties which are based on the illusions of the senses and go against truths. And any things they cannot grasp, they cast aside, saying that they do not yet understand them, and in so doing hold fast to their belief in the truth. Amen. Here in our lessons, and blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Imagine you're on your deathbed. The illness has come to the point that you know you only have a few days to live, not weeks, just a few days. And you have time to reflect on your life and recount the blessings of your life. The question is, what is on that list for you? What is on your list of blessings? And secondly, you ask around to have what you consider most important to be with you. So what do you ask for? Bring me in my car. Bring me my investment portfolio, my guitar collection, my computer, my phones. 
I want to see that episode of my favorite show one more time. No, of course not. We ask for our loved one, those we have a close relationship with. And it's also likely a time where we will rejoice over those relationships that we care deeply about and grieve for the temporary separation that we know is coming. And we likely will have some regrets. There's people we should have reconciled with, maybe. Or I could have been a better friend to that person. Could have been a more loving spouse. Could have been a more supportive parent. Could have been less concerned with my work and spend more time with my kids. I could have volunteered more. No one ever said, oh, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. <laughs> well, we have now. We have this chance. Here we are. We're here to work on building healthy relationships, which are grounded in this beautiful text, the Sermon on the Mount that the Lord gave. And this sermon is packed with meaning and healing truths that we all need. Relationships are what our life is about. It's our friendships, our family, our partner, ourself, our co-workers, our relationship with the Lord, with our children. So it's a good time to consider if the relationships in our life that we value are where we want them to be. Are we happy with how things are going in our relationships? And if not, are there things we can do differently? So we're going to begin looking at the blessings in our relationships today. Maybe fill our cup a little bit or backpack for the journey ahead, so to speak. And we may not think of what I'm going to talk about today necessarily as blessings in the traditional sense of the word, but they're more of a self-assessment. These blessings that the Lord offered are things that we can look at, observe about ourselves. Do we have this quality in us? So this first section of the Sermon on the Mount is considered the Beatitudes, the blessings. And there are things we can look at and say, are these strengths that I possess or things that I could work on? What qualities am I blessed with in my life? What could I do differently? How could I be better? So we're just going to go through these eight blessings and talk about them, and you can reflect on them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Is that saying, blessed are you when you're empty, when you're unhappy, when you're sad? Is this about being self-deprecating or not having self-esteem? Those of those of us who do act that way or know that, it doesn't really bring heaven closer to us, does it? It doesn't encourage closeness in friendships either. But blessed are the poor in spirit. The things of the spirit are things of the mind. By the poor are those who believe that they know nothing of themselves. So to be poor in spirit pictures those who are humble. I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. I'm poor in spirit. And as we heard a little bit of this passage earlier, it says, the divine of the Lord cannot flow into a proud heart, that is, into a heart full of the love of self. For such a heart is hard and is called in the word a heart of stone. So this quality we're looking at is, can we acknowledge how little we do know, rather than trying to prove how right we are? It's like, well, I don't really know. Can we be eager to learn and be eager to be taught? Because all growth involves humility. If we aren't humble, if we don't have humility, we can't grow, because we think we've got it all figured out, right? Why do I need to learn anything? I've got all the answers. <coughs> think about the 12-step program. The first couple steps are, we admitted we were powerless over whether it's drug or alcohol or sex or anything, whatever you're struggling with, admit we're powerless over this. And we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. We need help outside of ourselves. We can't do it by ourselves. And when we have that attitude, it improves our relationships. I don't know about you, but I don't think it's fun to be about around people who are full of themselves, <laughs> right? Or prideful. And they're never really happy either. Because the belief is that everyone else exists just to serve me. And nobody is really successful enough at doing that to make someone really value you if you're that way. It'll never happen, so we're never happy enough if we have that attitude. But humility is great medicine for relationship, because then things can grow, things can change. 
When we're humble, it prevents us from putting up walls and keeping people away from us because we welcome them into this relationship of life because we're all on this path together. And being humble means it's not all about me. <laughs> it's not all about you. We're in community with other people. The blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The second one is, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This invites us to consider how we act when we do something wrong. Do we have regret when we make a mistake? When we make bad choices, are we sorry about it? And in turn, try to take steps to make it right. Do we apologize to the person we may have harmed? Do we have regret? The Lord says, if you don't have, if you don't have conscience, you really have no hope. <laughs> and conscience is a recognition something doesn't feel right. There's a pain here. I did something I shouldn't have done. So it's having that regret when we make a mistake. And if we are truly sorry, we'll make ste steps to change that when something comes up. And we'll resist the temptation the next time it arises. So if we don't acknowledge our wrongs, we can't be let out of them. So how good are we at acknowledging our mistakes and saying we're sorry, admitting that? How about with our children? Do we admit when we make a mistake with them? Sorry I yelled at you. It's not your fault. I was angry. It's not about you. Or do we just say, well, their kids will handle it, right? Or with your partner, I shouldn't have been so impatient. I'm sorry. It's so simple when you just say it, when you're not in front of somebody else <laughs> who you might have had this issue with. But simple words, I'm sorry. Can we stop the wrong and start again? Learn from the past, but don't let it destroy our future or our present. Let's talk about guilt for just a second here, because thinking about the story of the prodigal son, how long do we need to carry around the guilt with us before it's been long enough? What do you think? <laughs> you know? I think there's probably a lot of us who carry guilt for a long time. It's like, well, I, I, I can't let go of this, or you just feel badly for a long time. But notice the story of the prodigal son. The son had gone off and wasted everything that his father had given him on riotous living. He was reckless, he was selfish, he did, he made some bad choices, but he came to his senses. He realized that this was a bad path, and he was willing to go back and be a servant in his father's household. But his father, who represents the Lord in this story, and this is about us, and when we make mistakes, the father was waiting for him, watching for him, looking out for him, hoping he would turn and come back. And when he saw him, he ran to him, and he fell on his neck, and he kissed him. And he showed him full acceptance back into his home. He gave, put a ring on his finger, a robe on him, sandals on his feet, and he killed the fatted calf, and they celebrated. It's a beautiful picture of the Lord's love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness for all of us. That is the truth. That's why the Lord told the story, because he wants us to know that's how he's responding to us. But what makes it possible is the son's recognition that I messed up that humility that says, I, I messed up. So blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are us when we can have that humility, that recognition, when we make a mistake. The third one is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know what the word meek means? What do you think of when you hear that word? Somebody is meek. I think it's lost its meaning in our culture, actually. Um, it doesn't mean what it used to mean. Today, it's kind of a an insult or a slur, if you called someone meek, they'd probably be insulted. Oh, Jesse, you're so meek. <laughs> what? It sounds like weak. Well, I mean, if you said your, the Broncos football team is really meek, you'd be like, that's not good, is it? You handled that so meekly. Well, the Greek word for meekness, it simply means to be gentle, to be humble, to be considerate, to be courteous. And it was originally used by doctors because doctors would use this word to describe a soothing medicine that would take away pain. So medicine that could maybe tame a fever, for example. So how does that illustrate meekness? Well, doctors would use medicine, but they'd use it in a precise manner. They would dish it out judiciously. Like, this is the amount you need to take. They wouldn't just say, hey, just have a bunch of this stuff and take as much as you want. Drugs, obviously, can be very useful, but they can also be abused. So you use it in a very targeted manner. 
So it means using self-control in a controlled manner. It's having strength, but having strength that's under control. So we don't flip out on people or use things to excess. We don't dump all of our junk and frustration on other people. We try to stay calm and be courteous and considerate of other people using self-control, realizing I need to control my actions. It's up to me. You can't just flip out and say, oh, sorry, I was just, just lost it. Yeah. Well, if you did, make amends for that. But try to have measured responses. <laughs> Is this a measured response or an appropriate response in the situation? Say your child says, hey, Dad, can you get me a glass of water? And you say, why are you always so lazy? Eh, don't have to be that way. That's not a measured response, is it? So blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The next one is hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's a sign that someone is not doing well if they're not hungry, they're not thirsty, right? If your child has lost their appetite, they're not thirsty, they're not hungry, you know that something isn't going right for them. We'd be concerned, and it can be a sign of a serious illness. Well, a sign that they would be getting better again is that they're, they have an appetite, is that they want to eat, and they're feeling healthy. And we can be this way about our religious life. So hungering and thirsting after righteousness is having a hunger and thirst for spiritual things. Maybe we used to be so excited about spiritual things. I used to go to church and I would get excited about it. I would read the books there. I'd be in discussion groups and go to small groups and those sort of things. And we just lost that. It's like, eh, it's not that important anymore. Why? Do we still hunger and thirst for it? Well, maybe we've already filled ourselves up with junk heavy snacking on media and streaming, right? We don't have time for anything else. We've got this whole diet we've, we've committed ourselves to. But hungering and thirsting for righteousness is longing for what is true and good, that it might happen, that it might come to pass, and that we may be part of making it happen, not just for ourselves, but for other people, too. Heavenly Doctrine says, by the hungry and thirsty are signified those who continually long for truths and long to be perfected by means of truth. So we care about truth, and we want it to change our life, we want to be impacted by it. Not just longing, we all have longings, but we desire it, and we make it an important part of our life. There's plenty of things you can feed on, spiritually, or in your mind, so to speak, that have nothing to do with your eternal health, right? Jesus says, you can drink this water, but you'll thirst again, the woman at the well. But I have water that will well up and within you, become a fountain unto everlasting life. So what do we long for? What do we make space for in our spiritual life? Swedenborg talks about these examples of people who longed for heaven. They burned with a desire for heaven. But when they got there, they couldn't stand it. Which sounds kind of strange, right? Like, you really wanted heaven, but now you're there, you can't handle it. <laughs> because there was nothing of heaven within them. They didn't take any time to foster that part of themselves. Psalm 37 says, Seek your happiness in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. I want to frame that as don't seek happiness, but seek the Lord, and you will find happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of seeking the Lord in your life. I think if we make happiness our goal, we're going to miss it. Because happiness isn't about seeking to be, find happiness. It's about seeking to be useful, seeking to find connection with the Lord and with other people. And that's where we find the happiness we're seeking. When you get tired of looking everywhere else, then maybe you'll say, well, maybe I'll try God, see what he knows, <laughs> right? Maybe I'll find happiness there. As scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All the things that we worry about, those are the things will be added to us if we seek first the kingdom of heaven. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then blessed are the merciful, do we acknowledge our own need for mercy? Do we recognize that we need the Lord to be merciful with us? Because we mess up. We make mistakes. And if we have that same recognition and we see other people that way, that will open us up to see the needs that other people have as well. If we think that we're better than other people or more perfect than them and hold them in contempt in comparison to ourselves, we shut ourselves off from relationships. 
Negative attitudes block the Lord's love and compassion from flowing into us and out of us. The word mercy has a very special meaning that really opens up the meaning that the Lord has in mind when he uses this word. It's kezed, and it means the ability to get right inside the other person's skin until we can see things with their eyes and feel things like we're walking in their shoes. We can feel what it's like to be that person. That's what the Lord means by being merciful. You really put yourself in that person's situation so you can have compassion. Even if we don't know them or despise them, we can use our imagination to kind of imagine what that would be like. And there's such power putting ourselves in other people's shoes because it makes us so much more humble. Because we, we might see someone who we consider to be living a dysfunctional life and go, but there, but for the grace of God, go I. I could be, I could so easily be in that situation. And I'm so grateful for how the Lord is helping me. And I know I could be there in a heartbeat if I wasn't careful. So blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This beatitude is really about regeneration, about spiritual growth. The heart is a symbol for our love, what we care about, who we are in our very being. And are we willing to make a commitment to self-improve for the sake of everyone else in our life and the sake of our eternal life? Recognizing that this is why I'm here. I am here to do the work of my spiritual life. It's not just about collecting stuff for the sake of immediate gratification. I'm working towards a pure heart, and I'm going to commit myself to it, commit to self-examination, to repentance, to shunning evils when they arise, and doing what's good. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. This is really about how we relate with other people. Are we contentious? Do we look for conflict? Do we look for differences in other people? Or do we try to find the common ground that exists between us? Do we try to really listen to people and try to be respectful of where they're coming from? Notice it's peacemaker. It's an active statement. Blessed are the peacemakers. Are we actually trying to make peace? Are we taking the time to be courteous in how we speak? Are we careful with the things we say? Are we careful of other people's feelings? Not jumping to negative conclusions about them and throwing out comments without consideration. Really listen. Try to figure out what's being communicated. It might not be what you think. Don't assume you know the motives of anybody else. So stay calm. Be a peacemaker. Unless something's on fire, you can remain calm and figure it out. And the last one is, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's an odd one, isn't it? Blessed are those who are persecuted. <laughs> What's the Lord saying? Well, he's saying, Blessed are those who recognize that spiritual growth that change is difficult. It is hard. So I can say all these things like, have that be humble, be merciful, be forgiving, and all that stuff. Yeah, 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 we know that, but it's hard, right? It's hard to do that. It's a recognition that it is difficult, but we're willing to do the work that needs to be done in order to have a change of spirit, a change of heart. Recognizing it's a process, but I'm willing to do the work of going through this process. And it's interesting, too, the word uh, for all these beatitudes, blessed are the pure and blessed are the, the meek and so forth. That word blessed means supremely blissfully happy. It's not just like blessed, but extremely happy are the people who are this way. Do we have these qualities? If we do, we can be supremely happy. So as we begin talking about these relationships, think about the blessings in your own life. What are your assets? What qualities do you bring to the table? What are the good things the Lord has blessed you with? And what are the things that maybe you need to work on? Do I have humility? Am I willing to admit mistakes? Am I a courteous person? Do I hope and work for good? Do I care about the cares of other people? Am I committed to my own self-improvement? Do I look for common ground when I meet somebody? Do I recognize that change is difficult and I can be, try to be patient and determined? 
And the really important thing is self-awareness as we try to foster our relationships and our attitudes. Are we willing to change if change is necessary? So I invite you this week to take time to reflect upon how you stack up to the things we talked about today. Where do you find strengths in your life? Where do you find weaknesses? And can I commit to doing the work of improving my spiritual life for the sake of all of my relationships? Relationship with myself, my relationship with the Lord, with my partner, with my family, my friends, my coworkers, with society. There's so many relationships that we have. We could do some work and we can improve. Amen. Bow our heads for a moment for a prayer. Lord, you've given us much to think about in this beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a lot we can reflect on in our own journey about our attitudes and where we find ourselves. And the beautiful thing is that wherever we do find ourselves, there is always the opportunity for growth and change. For with God, all things are possible. But without you, we can do nothing. Be with us, Lord, so that change can happen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I'll let you to stand for the closing of the word if you're able. Please remain standing as we sing on page 32. Blessed be your name, page 32. Take away, you give and take away, my heart will
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Let's be seated. Searching. 